Welcome, everybody. Um, schönen guten Tag, um, schönen guten Abend um, zum Vortrag von Stefania Demchuk. Um, the presentation is going to be in English, and so is my introduction. Um, I'm very happy to introduce Stefania Demchuk to you. She's an assistant professor of art history at Taras Shevchenko National University, Kiev, and currently a research fellow at Masaryk University in Brno. Brünn. Um, her PhD was on early modern popular culture in the Netherlands. And she is also currently working on a postdoctoral project devoted to the culture of memory and art of 16th century Netherlands. Her talk today, however, is of a different nature, not um, strictly related to Dutch Golden Age, because it's a, um, a study of historiography um, within a project that is currently being um, executed in Brno by Matthew Rampley, which looks at exchanges between Western and Eastern European art histories. And the title of her presentation tonight is the Colonizing Ukrainian Art History, which is of course very interesting because colony and Ukraine. We had a German-Polish conference the other day where Ukraine and Polish were discussed in terms of um, empire and uh, colony. So we are very um, eager to learn a new perspective here. Thank you very much for coming. Good evening, everyone. I'm really grateful for the invitation uh, to speak to you uh, today. I'm grateful for Professor Pistra for inviting me. Uh, and I feel also quite privileged to talk about uh, history of Ukrainian art history right now, because uh, I think that today is quite a pressure issue and we feel that we need to write about art, art of Ukraine and art of, art of uh, different countries of the world differently than we did before. So uh, not far from the place where I live now in Brno, on Brno and Amistis, to say square, there is a memorial to the victims of the World War I, people murdered by the Nazis, and those buried during the communist regime. A similar memorial could have been erected in every Ukrainian city, town or village, since Ukraine's history has a lot in common with the Czech one. However, one can find in Ukraine only the memorials to the victims and soldiers who perished in VV2. In fact, those monuments are not even consecrated to World War II, but the Great Patriotic War, a term coined by the Soviet propaganda to refer to the period from 1941 through 1945. Astoundingly, virtually no memorials to the fallen in the World War I, no victims of the totalitarian Soviet regime can be found anywhere in Ukraine. That situation is a conspicuous product of the Soviet and later Russian politics of memory that was imposed on Ukraine and internalized. The politics of memory in its turn is one of the elements of a broader colonial project that I will address prior to diving into Ukrainian art history. The Russian colonial narratives continue to shape and affect Ukraine's internal policy and international image, making others perceive Ukraine through the Russian lenses. The present paper aspires to spark a discussion on Ukrainian art history from a post-colonial perspective. I consider this as a first step to address assessing Ukrainian art and art historiography and examining them from a transnational perspective. I shall start by addressing the genesis of the art history in Ukraine and its methodological underpinnings. Then I proceed with exposing the changes introduced in the Soviet times that resulted in terminological ambiguity that affects modern studies and hinders the progress in working out a uniform international recognition. In this part of my speech, I shall try to pinpoint the reasons that inspired art critic Alexander Lopuchov to argue in 1985 that the theory of art is absent in Ukrainian scholarship. 
In the final part of my speech, I shall address the Ukrainian art historiography after 1991, concluding with the communization and the de derusification as parts of the contemporary process of the decolonization and establishment of the new Ukrainian art history. Considered in a wider intellectual context, Ukrainian postcolonial experience can shed light on the peculiarities of Eastern European colonialism and ways of overcoming them. His, uh, historian Richard Cohen, in his Making History, cites a 1989 article by Ricky Kirsten, who commented on Japanese after war revisionism and its manifestations in the school textbooks. By depicting Japanese war criminals as victims of Western imperialism, revisionists want their school children to memorize pre war Japan as a heroic nation that struggled to free its Asian neighbors from Western aggression. It is amazing how similar it sounds to our ears now when you, Russia invaded Ukraine under the false pretext of saving the Russian speaking people in Ukraine and defending Ukraine from becoming a colony of the USA. It means that there is a common underlying principle behind the Russian and Japanese colonial narratives. Both were constructed in their position to the West, mainly to Western Europe and the USA, and to its cultural and geographic expansion. Both were used to justify military aggressions, deportation, rape, and murder of civilians. Finally, both aimed at turning aggressors into victims who were made to defend themselves in order to survive. But there are differences too. Unlike Japan, the Russian national idea is grounded on the irredentist dogma of the true united Russian nation, with the Russian nation being as a big brother for the other two, little Russians, Ukrainians, and white Russians, Belarusians. They are to be united under one great Russian rule, profess one religion, the Eastern Christian Orthodoxy, and speak one Russian language. Therefore, the lands of Ukraine and Belarus are to be purged from the foreign influences and religion. They are not entitled to build their own national identities and to enter unions with other countries without the supreme permission from Russia. This dogma underpins every aspect of the Russian policy towards Ukraine and Belarus. As I shall argue, it is also crucial for the development of our history in Ukraine. The first thing I need to discuss really briefly is the term Little Russia that is still used by Russian propaganda. The term has a Greek origin and was used by the patriarchs of Constantinople to refer to the smaller or less populated part of Rus. Uh, by no means, Little Russia at the beginning was meant to stand for the whole territory of present-day Ukraine. Only in the middle of the 17th century, it was broadened to the other territories of the so-called Hetmanshina. After the truce of Andrusiv of 1667, the territories of Hetmanshina were once more divided between Russia and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. The left bank territories under the name of Little Russia were annexed by Russia. Ever since the Russians started to refer to Ukraine as Little Russia, it became a part of the discourse of the true United Russian nation. Uh, the dogma itself uh, dates back to the Peter's first times. Not having enough support from his peers, Peter I relied upon the Ukrainian intellectual elite. One of the most brilliant and controversial figures among Peter's supporters was the Kiev-born dean of the Kiev Mahila Academy, Theofan Prokopovich. He became one of the first agents of Russian colonialism and the reason why Ukraine had later become a colonized element within the Russian Empire. Stefan Prokopovich first came into prominence in 1715 as Peter's protege to become the Bishop of Pskov in 1718 and the Archbishop of Novgorod in 1725. He was commissioned to help the Tsar to integrate the Orthodox Church into the state so there would be only one head of the country. It is worth emphasizing that relations between the church and the Russian government are still extremely tight, even nowadays. The political centralization and integration of the Eastern Orthodox Church into the state were followed by the introduction of the imperial cultural policy and linguistic marginalization. Here, I would like to mention just one case. The Millennium of Russia, a bronze monument, 
erected in 1862 in the historic center of Novgorod, was supposed to commemorate the arrival of Rurik, a Varangian chieftain, to Novgorod, as it was considered to be the inception of Russia's statehood. The concept of continuous statehood, however, is highly dubious, as well as the idea of Russia being the genuine heir to medieval Rus with its center in Kyiv. Again, it was Prokopovich who insisted on this line of succession. The monument itself is a 15 meters tall bronze globus cruciger planted on a bell-shaped granite pedestal. Sculptures that adorn the monument can be split into three logical groups, an angel and a kneeling woman in the first rank, epitomize orthodox faith and Russia itself, uh, the purported unity of the church and the state. However, the image of a kneeling Russia did spark heated discussions back then. The second rank comprises 17 colossal figures whose contribution to Russia's statehood was considered extraordinary. They are grouped to present six major scenes, the summoning of Rurik, the battles of medieval Rus, the battle of Kulikovo, the autocracy of Ivan III, the start of the Romanov dynasty, and the formation of an empire under Peter I. The iconography of the frieze in the lower part is the most striking. It reveals the way in which uh, the history of Russia as an empire was forged. The frieze comprises 109 figures of contributors to Russia's glory. Each person was approved by the emperor himself. There were writers and painters, educators, statesmen, and military heroes. Mikola Gogol, a Ukrainian-born writer, uh, who started to write in the little Russian language, but had to move to St. Petersburg, was standing alongside Alexander Pushkin and Mikhail Lermontov. You can see it is this group, and Pushkin is standing right in the center, with uh, Google on our right, and Lermontov on our left. Pushkin's figure is remarkably taller than that of Gogol or L Lermontov, even though he had not been taller than his peers in the real life. This disproportion reminds us of the symbolic hierarchy of medieval icons. Amongst educators were portrayed Byzantine brothers Cyril and Methodius, who are said to have authored the Slav alphabet, Olga, who was a regent of medieval Rus on uh, behalf of her son Svetoslav, and her grandson Vladimir I, who installed himself as a royal ruler of the Rus and baptized the country. Just merely taking into consideration these names, it is evident now the 19th century Russia inflated its own history that was quite brief and started from the 16th century when the Romanov dynasty took the power. They tried to associate themselves with the medieval Rus uh, with a center in Kiev ruled by a Varangian dynasty that had nothing to do uh, with the present day Russia. Moreover, the imperial cultural policy tried to appropriate the Lithuanian history too. Three Lithuanian rulers, Algirdas, Gediminas, and Vitotos, were proclaimed uh, to be Russia's allies fighting with, Pol uh, uh, <coughs> uh, with Poland for the Ruthenian territories. A very dubious statement to say the least. Moreover, the brief alliances with Lithuania were presented as proof that Lithuania too was destined to reunite with Russia, which actually happened during the Soviet times. The most controversial part of the monument is devoted to the display of the Russian military heroes. The great Prince of Kyiv Svetoslav, the Prince Danilo of Galicia, Ukrainian Hetman Bogdan Khmelnytsky, and Ukrainian Prince Konstantin Ostrovsky were surprisingly included in the rest of, of the Ru Russian military glory, together with Ivan Susanian, Mikhail Kutuzov, Ivan Suvorov, or Yermak, a rather mythical conqueror of Siberia. This monument symbolized the integration of Ukrainian history into the Russian imperial narrative. Ukrainian statesmen, writers, and educators were proclaimed to be Russians. This strategy will be adopted by Soviet authorities and intelligentsia and their post-Soviet successors. And I will put these claims in the context of the Soviet and modern art historical narratives. 
And despite being the fruit of the 18th century historiography, the dogma of the true and I Russian nation received its final touches during the Soviet rule. In the monograph, for example, by Vladimir Mavrodin, the ancient Rus, the origins of the Russian people and the formation of the Kievan state, who referred to the Kievan Rus as the common cradle of Eastern Slavs. Following his statement about the ethnic unity of the Kievan Rus, refuted in a number of publications ever since, Soviet philologists argued for the existence of a common language in the Kiev Rus. Later on, this common language was altered in Ukraine and Belarus under the influence of the Polish and Lithuanian languages, argued Soviet scholars. They conclude that once again, Russia, even under Soviet rule, appears to be a lawful heir of Rus entitled to re reunite with the, its ancient territories. Art history in Ukraine developed following Russia's colonial modes designed in the late 18th, 19th century and inherited by Soviet Union. It was characterized by the further marginalization of Ukrainian language, propagation of Russian as a language of scholarship and imposition of the institutional hierarchy where Moscow and St. Petersburg preserved their primacy while Ukraine was regarded as a remote province with parochial scholarship. From the very beginning, Ukrainian art history had three main centers, Kyiv, Kharkiv, and Odessa, whose universities were found in 1864, 1805, and 1865, respectively. However, whenever you try to write a comprehensive historiography a historiographical survey, you face the difficulty of finding the art historians who qualify to be referred to as Ukrainian without any reservations. All art historians who were born in Russia but worked in Ukraine or vice versa are considered Russian. This fact can also be regarded as a kind of cultural appropriation. Moreover, this narrative of the Russian art historiography is broadcasted worldwide, consolidating the construct of the great Russian culture. Thus, uh, the early Ukrainian art history requires a thorough and profound reconstruction. The Department of Theory and History of Art was funded at the Kharkiv University back, back in 1863, only six years later than the eponymous department at the Moscow University. Igor Redin, a student of Nikodim Kondakov, a scholar famous for his studies in medieval iconography, had served as the department's director for 30 years. Redin is a good example of academic exchanges during the early history of Ukrainian universities. He graduated from the Odessa University, where he wrote his thesis under the Kondakov supervision. Thus, in his essays on Byzantine art, Redin focused on attribution, examination of style, and iconographic analysis. Just as Kondakov, Redin was interested in showcasing the Eastern Syriac influence on the art of Rus with the Byzantine art serving as an intermediary. In his further studies, he followed the Kondakov's trail and explored Greek and Italian influences on the art of medieval Ukraine, employing iconographic analysis and searching for stylistic similarities. Fedor Schmidt was another important art historian from Kharkiv, who to a certain extent can be considered as a follower of Kodakov and Redens. Schmidt was born and educated in St. Petersburg. He moved to Kharkiv in 1912 after graduating from the University of St. Petersburg. Schmidt worked as a professor at the Department of Theory and History of Art at the Kharkiv University until 1921, when he moved to Kyiv to take over the Archaeological Commission of the All Ukrainian Academy of Sciences and lecture at the Kyiv Arts Institute. He signed the, the protest petition against the Red Terror in the summer of 1919, and as a consequence, he was arrested in St. Petersburg later on in 1932 and executed in Tashkent in 1937. Thus, his life is a perfect example of the uh, entanglement of Ukrainian and Russian art history. Schmidt's uh, outstanding contribution to Kharkiv School of Art history is irrefutable. Whereas Schmidt 
adhered to Kondoko's iconographic method in his study of uh, medieval Ras art. He went beyond its limits in his theoretical essays, the laws of history, introduction to general art history, and art, its psychology, stylistic uh, evolution. The ideas uh, that seemed to be rather vague in the former essay were refined and reorganized in the letter. Drawing on Vico's concept of the cyclical development of culture and history and Wolfland's categories, Schmidt proposed a six-parted model of the art historical development and identified a core artistic problem for each period. First, irrealism, the problem of rhythm. Second, idealism, the problem of form. Third, naturalism, the problem of composition. Fourth, realism, the problem of action. Then fifth, illusionism, the problem of space. And the last, impressionism, the problem of light. Unfortunately, following his tragic deaths and repressions against his students at Kharkiv University, the theoretical research perished too. The art historical research in Kyiv started with the establishment of the Imperial University of St. Vladimir in 1834. At first, it was only a cabinet of fine arts that stored the actual artworks confiscated from the Lyceum Kremenetsky. Uh, it was closed several years earlier because of the Polish upheaval of 1830-31. The cabinet was turned into a department of theory and history of art in 1875 and existed until the revolution when it was transferred to the Ukrainian Academy of Arts. Grigory Pavlutsky, the future head of the department, was born in Kyiv. He received a classical education at a Kyiv grammar school and entered the university to study classical philology. During his studies, he shifted his focus to Greek art and devoted his master thesis to the genesis of the Corinthian order. At first, uh, Pavlutsky got a negative review from Adrian Prahov, who held a professorship in the department at that time. Prahov, was, who was born in Belarus and educated in St. Petersburg, treated Pavlutsky with contempt, often adopted by the Russian intelligentsia toward their Ukrainian peers. Uh, Fedor Fortinsky, the dean of the university, considered the review a result of a conflict of interests. Pavlutsky might aim at becoming professor too, and appointed other reviewers who praised the Pavlutsky's research. Nevertheless, after a couple of essays on Greek art, Pavlutsky decided to switch to Ukrainian art, considering it a safer option. Pavlutsky's method developed on the comparativist approach. He compared artworks of different periods and different masters in order to probe the connections between them. In his essay of early 1900s, boldly titled on the link between art and culture, he also argued that artworks must be put into the historical context. Basically, he argued for uh, Kunzgeschicht that became one of the dominant approaches in uh, the European art scholarship of the first decade of the uh, 20, uh, late 19th and early 20th century. <sighs> Russification and cultural appropriation continued under Soviet rule despite the short-lived policy of Ukrainization of the 1920s. However, they were not on the only tools of oppression and colonization. The new terminology, the so-called Newspeak, was imposed. The Newspeak isolated Soviet uh, humanities from the outer world, and the history of art followed the suit. Uh, the so-called Iskostvovedenia Mestetstvoznavstvo in Ukrainian merged the theory and history of art and art criticism into a methodologically heterogeneous mixture. Mestetstvoznavstvo, as an official title of scientific degrees, was introduced by the resolution of the Council of People's Commissar of the USSR on scientific degrees and titles in 1937. The title of the degree occurred a deep rift once and for, uh, for all uh, between the Soviet scholarship, including its Ukrainian branch, and the Western world. Nomen est omen, despite the preservation of the Department of Theory uh, and History of Art, Soviet science of art had lost its structure and disciplinary clarity. 
To this day, Mr. Svoznostvo remains the name of a scientific degree and stands in the way, uh, as I shall argue later on, of the successful integration of Ukrainian scholarship into the international academic community. For the sake of consistency, I undertake to refer to the Ukrainian scholars as our historians, despite the fact that the name of their degree in Ukrainian is closer to an art expert. I suppose that Soviet scholars borrowed the term Iskustovedenie uh, and Mistotsuznavstvo from German language scholarship, for it is the literal translation of the term Kunstwissenschaft. It had to merge art, criticism, theory, and history of art. It brings to mind somehow Hans Zedelmeier's paper of 1933, where he introduced the second science of art that marks the establishment of the new Vienna School. In his paper, Zedelmeier used the term Kunstwissenschaft as superior to Kunstgeschichte. Uh, major Soviet scholars like Mikhail Alpatov were under the spell of the Vienna School and taking into consideration that the first translation of Zedelmeier's over came out in 1935 and 36, it looks quite natural that they might have chosen the Russian version of Kunstwissenschaft as the title for the new independent science. German and Austrian scholarship played a prominent role in the Russian and Ukrainian art history before the revolution too. The first Russian translations of Adolf Hildebrandt's works emerged in 1913, whereas Heinrich Wölflin's classical art uh, in 1912, followed by Renaissance and Bayer in 1913, and on the interpretation of art published in 1925-22, and the major concept in uh, 1930. One would expect a drastic change in the methodological underpinnings of art history under the Soviet rule, but it was not completely the case. Of course, uh, Marxist terminology was adopted, but it could have never replaced the adherence to the formalism of Russian art historians. In addition to the translation of Zedelma's paper mentioned earlier, an abridged version of History of Art as a History of Spirit by Max Dvorak was published in 1934. Thus, the adoption of, of a German name for the discipline looks coherent with the methodological preferences of the Russian Soviet scholars. The introduction of the term Iskustovedenie also meant the rupture of the discipline's subordination to history and emphasized its independence. So, Iskustovedenie, uh, as Mr. Suznavstvo, was introduced to the Ukrainian institutions at the same time. It happened to coincide, however, with, with the executions and repressions of Ukrainian writers, artists, and art historians known in historiography under the term the executed renaissance of the Red Renaissance. It meant the end of the policy of Ukrainization initiated by Soviet authorities in the early 1920s. It put the issue of language marginalization back on the agenda. Ukrainization strived to mark the shift in cultural policy with the arrival of Soviets. The prison of nations as the Russian imperial regime was branded, had to be replaced with the friendship of nations under Soviet rule. The Ems decree uh, was revoked of the revolution, therefore the Ukrainian language could become a means of cultural communication. However, the drastic changes of the 1930s signal the, the beginning of a new period of Russia's colonial expansions and Iskustvovedenie as an official term uh, and the whole science of art behind it can be regarded as one of the tools of the new cultural policy. In addition to the terminology, there were other efforts to provincialize Ukrainian scholarship. The departments of theory and history of art were transferred from the universities to the newly established academic of arts, where teaching was limited to connoisseurship and the history of styles. For example, in Kyiv, the department was transferred to the Ukrainian Academy of Arts, founded on uh, December 5th, 1917, where it stays until now. In Kharkiv too, the Department of Theory and History of Art was closed in 1920, when the university was turned into the Institute of People's Education. As uh, Ludmila Melnichuk put it, in 1926, only a subdivision of art history was created 
as a part of the Department of All Ukrainian Academy of Sciences in Kyiv, the staff of this subdivision was formed mostly of Fedor Schmidt students. They all got arrested in 1933. Although they managed to survive, the persecution of uh, the subdivision of theory and history of art uh, was re-established 30 years later as a part of the Department of Marxism and Leninism and the Kharkiv Institute of Arts and Design. The subdivision became an independent department only in 1992. The lack of PhD programs and scholarships that could have made it possible for Ukrainian scholars to go abroad and study Western or Eastern art, as did their Russian colleagues, forced young art historians to go to Moscow or St. Petersburg. When they did go back from the cities of the metropole, they came uh, acting as a colonizing element uh, who bring in new ideas to the remote provinces so to say, their Ukrainian departments of the academies. Meanwhile, the departments of theory and history of art continued to thrive in the Russian classic universities, and the prominent Russian scholars often went on research trips and conferences to Western Europe. Therefore, the absence of PhD programs until the late 1950s, the lack of art historical literature in the languages other than Russian, and the prominence of scholars who graduated from Russian universities resulted in the imposition of the parochial character on the Ukrainian art history, as well as on the other branches of knowledge. How did this strategy impact art historical writing? First, Ukrainian art historians focused almost exclusively on Ukrainian art as an integral part of the old Soviet paradigm. Their monographs were conceived only for the internal Soviet audience. Studies on Western art were virtually absent. Positivist methodology adorned with Marxist-Leninist term uh, was encouraged. Thus, it is next to impossible to find anything related to the theory or methodology of art. This brings us back to the world of Alexander Lopehov I quoted earlier. One has to point out that theoretical training of the art historian needs a lot of work, for it is now that Ukrainian art historians do not trace issues of theory. Let's just briefly examine one work uh, from the Soviet period. It's a monograph by Platon Bilecki, one of the most famous Ukrainian art historians. In his monograph, he addressed the Ukrainian portrait painting of the 17th and 18th century. It is written in Russian and was published by Leningrad-based publishing house. Bilecki tried to avoid referring, uh, referring to methodology related to the writing of Marx, Engels or Lenin, focusing mostly on attribution and stylistic issues. It does not mean though that the book is free of Soviet Russian uh, cliches. The Orthodox art was examined as opposed to the Catholic painting branded as a tool of oppression. The Polish magnates whose portraits he studied were described as insolent and condescending. Emphasizing the role of Poland as an enemy and the Catholic religion as alien to Ukrainians, promoted the interests of Russia and its constructs of Ukraine as part of the Russian world that has not, uh, not lost its significance even in the face of specious Soviet internationalism. Bilecki paved the way too for the post-Soviet Ukrainian art historiography where the concept of the nation became a, a framework for writing on art. For, as he said, there is no need to include in history of Ukrainian art everything that was once created in Ukraine or by its natives far from the homeland. Ethnicity and orthodoxy will become the key to the Ukrainianness of art in the first decades of Ukraine's independence. The independence brought an end to the colonial oppression, but in a way it uh, also was full of challenges. The need to fill the gap in knowledge made Ukrainian art historians turn to the concept of nation as a framework for art historical writing. But Soviet heritage uh, could not just be shaken off and the product of these efforts was rather biased. Uh, the reforms of the Kyiv Arts Institute are a good example of this trend. As artist and curator Ladana Konechna put it, 
Reforms were limited to bringing back the original title, the Ukrainian Academy of Arts, and the restoration of the structure introduced by the statute of 1917, aiming at holding personal work uh, workshops with students assigned to one of their electives. Several new workshops were established, uh, but uh, respect to the Department of Theory and History of Art, the only change uh, at the beginning consisted in the introduction of art management into the curriculum in 1992. With respect to art historical production, publishing of encyclopedias, surveys of Ukrainian art and biographies of artists dominated the landscape. A Rinsky Institute of Art Studies, Folklore and Ethnology published the history of Ukrainian art in six volumes and the history of Ukrainian applied arts that can be considered as an epitome of the Ukrainian national art historiography. The use of the term Rus Ukraine when referring to the period from 13th until the first half of the 16th century exposes the underpinning idea of building a continuous narrative of Ukrainian art as an uncontested entity. Also, looking for Ukrainian tradition in the art of that period is rather premature, since the territories were divided between the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and the Grand Duchy of Moscow, and thus the history of art were too entangled. The rationale for ignoring the artworks created on the territory of Ukraine by artists of a different nationality also seems rather dubious. The establishment of the Modern Art Research Institute in 2001 was a way to deal with the Soviet inertia, plugging the other traditional art historical institutions that were reluctant to accept the contemporary art as well as the postmodern methodology. However, their research output proves the impossibility of tectonic change within the smothering paradigm of Mr. Stosnavstvo. For example, the almost total absence of work in theory and methodology of art is quite representative. Only Alexander Klikovkin, who is corresponding member of the National Academy of Arts, addressed the issues of methodology in a range of his essays and handbooks. In the most recent handbook, Art Methodology of Research, Klikovkin tried to shortlist the prominent school and methodologies of the uh, 20th and 21st centuries, but ended up with a rather confusing survey a scholarship hardly relevant to contemporary art history. He expatiates upon uh, mythological and ethnological approaches, but fails uh, to mention the Vienna School of Art History or iconology or visual studies visual culture studies. The review of Ukrainian art historiography re remains sporadic and biographical. One of the rare attempts to write a more cohesive account of the art history was made in the book by Mikhailo Krivolapov, an art critic. Of course, he was writing about the genesis and the evolution of Mr. Suznastu in Ukraine, which makes his study inconsistent. He keeps shifting from art historians to art critics with an, with an emphasis on the latter. Also, he ventured to topple the Soviet narrative of Ukrainian art historiography and present its achievements. Krivolap nevertheless had never questioned the validity of term Mr. Another issue with Krivolapov's survey consists in the fact that he lists the literature or mentions important scholar failing to analyze their contribution to the field. Thus, the reader can only guess about the key ideas, methodological approaches or weaknesses of the uh, preceding scholarship. Since, as it was common in Soviet surveys, the historiographical review uh, remained superficial. Although the facts he gathered still can be a starting point for the further discussion on the Ukrainian art historiography. The war of narratives was another characteristic feature of the 1990s that gained momentum over time. The notion of the Russian avant-garde is one of the most prominent cases. For a long time, painters who worked principally in Moscow in 1920s were known in Western Europe as Russian avant-garde artists, although their origin and identity were not homogeneous. From the beginning of 1980, the whole body of their work uh, was tagged as the Russian avant-garde at the exhibition all over the world. The term Ukrainian avant-garde was introduced by French art historian Andrei Nakov while discussing artists whose works were presented 
at the Totland's uh, Dreams exhibition in London in uh, 1973. The coexistence of these two terms and the dominance of the Russian avant-garde showcases the Russian strategy of cultural appropriation. Of course, some of the artists work for a limited period of time in Moscow, but not all of them identify themselves as Russians. Alexandra Exter, for example, for a long time had had a studio in Kyiv. David Burluk, the so-called father of Russian futurism, was born in Kharkiv region and attended the art school in Odessa. Alexander Arhipenko was born in Kyiv, where he studied to become an artist and worked uh, there until his immigration. Thus, the acknowledgement of the entanglement of avant-garde history has to be an important step towards a less biased and politicized history of art. Despite the clashes over the Soviet heritage, bizarre friendship with Russia, however, went on. Academies have been using Russian handbooks in theory and history of art. Some of the hardness ex-Soviet professors continued to lecture in Russian. Thus, the pending inevitable confrontation between the two trends, the national and post-Soviet spirit of the friendship between nations, so say between Russia and Ukraine, was about to erupt. The revolution of dignity exposed all discrepancies in Ukrainian art history and made the community face the identity crisis. The revolution of dignity of 2013-14 proved to be a turning point for Ukrainian art history since it forced Ukrainian art historians and the whole society to consider the consequences of the last and deeply rooted colonial legacy. Decommunization is a process of dismantling the heritage of the communist state institutions, culture, and psychology in the post-communist countries was also a first step, step to the breakup with, from Russia, where pro-Soviet feelings were still quite strong. Decommunization also meant radical change in the policy of cultural memory and marked the start of Ukraine's decolonization. At the same time, it traded the issue of reconsidering and preserving Soviet cultural heritage. The exhibition here is an inventory in the making under curatorship of Michael Ferrer from Berlin and the, uh, the team of the National Museum of Art from Kyiv was the first attempt to address the Soviet artistic and ideological heritage in an impartial context without the nationalistic bias. The curators aspired to present Ukrainian heroes of different periods, from the Cossacks to Soviet soldiers, from portraits of hetmans to the busts of Lenin or Marx. It can be interpreted as a first step to acknowledging the Tsarist and Soviet heritage, but also an attempt to draw a line between the present and the past as a means of getting over it. The communization sparked interest in the Western theory of art and contemporary art. Given the absence of significant theoretical or methodological works in Ukrainian scholarship, the emergence of Ukrainian translations of important essays by Western art historians was expected. However, they were published by the small publishing houses, while their bigger and older counterparts, like Rodovid or Mustestvo, continued to focus on the catalogs, biographical sketches, or albums created for a wider public. For example, IST Publishing focused on contemporary art and theory. They published a translation of John Berger's Ways of Seeing, Hans Ulrich Gumbrecht's Productions of Present, uh, interviews of Henri Cartier-Bresson, a collection of essays edited by Bruno Latour and Rem Kolhas, or Pascal Guillen's Performing the Common City. Despite uh, the outbreak of the war, the Ukrainian translation of Camaro Lucida by Roland Barth uh, was released a couple of months ago uh, by Moksoba, Museum of the Kharkiv Har School of Photography. This period also witnessed a change in the institution of art historical education, uh, uh, that is to say the aggravating uh, decline of the National Academy of Arts and the establishment of the Department of Art History uh, at Taras Shevchenko uh, National University of Kyiv. Uh, as Ladan Akonechny described the crisis in the National Academy of Art, uh, the structure of the academy and its curriculum had had only abysmal changes since the last reform, making it impossible to introduce new courses in contemporary art, both in practice and theory. 
The Department of Theory and History of Art there is following the suite. Despite the introduction of art management in the curriculum, the staff uh, commission for the course had received education back in Soviet times mostly and were reluctant to accept and teach, uh, for example, social art history or visual studies. Thus, uh, the establishment of the restoration of the Department of Art History at Taras Shevchenko National University of Kyiv was an important step in the modernization of Ukrainian art historical knowledge and scholarship. The loss of the monopoly infuriated the colleagues from the National Academy of Arts. They accused the founders of the department, the lack of professional skills and the proper art historical training, since the initial staff of the department consisted solely of the trained historians. However, a different academic background proved to have uh, its own benefits. The curriculum of the newly established department included courses in theory and methodology of art. Students were taught the methods of social art history and anthropology of image, semiotic and iconological analysis, in addition to iconographic and uh, formal analysis. The department also offered courses on contemporary art and curatorship. The establishment of the department became an element of the decolonization of art historical education and scholarship. Uh, the lack of the Soviet-baked education in Mr. Sosnavstvo helped the staff to forge a new kind of academic identity in a different, mostly Western context. context. It shows not only uh, in the approach to education, but also in their own research, focusing on the Western and non-Ukrainian art rather uncommon for Ukrainian art historiography. Of course, westernization cannot be the only way to decolonize a discipline, but it's also true that without acknowledging and digesting the ideas and methods of Western and Central European scholarship, the new Ukrainian art history won't emerge. Bringing Ukraine back into the East Central European context also implies the, its reintegration into the academic discourse. An example of the evolution uh, of a different kind of art historical writing in the book, The Permanent Revolution, uh, Art in Ukraine, the 20th to the early 21st century, published by uh, Lisa Loshkina, a curator and journalist, uh, who uh, had not, uh, has not graduated from the National Academy of Arts, but from the Kyiv Mahila Academy, which is another proof of the impossibility of a change within the system inherited from the Soviet Union. Uh, the book is a coherent account of Ukrainian modern art under the Soviet regime and in the times of independence, but it avoids discussing the concept of Ukrainian art, which is problematic given its entangled history. Although the title did suggest that author will discuss the art in Ukraine as a territory and not about Ukrainian art as something belonging to the national discourse only. Ukrainian art critics and historians uh, berated the book. Its author was accused of being biased and subjectivistic, breaching the standards of academic writing and misusing the terms and concept. But in my opinion, it was too uh, a conflict of the discourses. From the very beginning, Ukrainian art historians created the texts only for the internal use that were quite different from the texts intended for the Western readership. Thus, Alisa Loshkina's book, which was intended for foreign readers, inevitably contained facts all too well known to Ukrainians or discussed the personalities sanctified by the national history of art in a way that could be considered offensive. Therefore, the period from the Revolution of Dignity until February 2022 can be considered a window of possibilities. The educational and professional background of the new generations of uh, Ukrainian art historians became more heterogeneous and their contacts with the international community more robust. These trends made inevitable the confrontation with the pro-Soviet art historians who continued insisting on the traditional way of art historical writing imposed in the 1930s paradigm. This confrontation, as I shall argue, has to evolve into the new Ukrainian art history, as opposed to the traditional Mestestuznost, as it is a Soviet construct and therefore is unable to cope with its own limitations. Therefore, it too has to be documented. The open war uh, Russia started on the February 24 made decolonization the most pressing issue and sparked a series of heated debates. What started as a decommunization eventually transformed into derisification that questions every aspect of Russia's cultural memory infiltrating the Ukrainian scenery. 
uh, what does the change in historical narrative mean for Ukrainian art history? Firstly, we have to denounce the term Mr. Suznas as one of the colonial tools. Even though Ukrainian art historians have done amazing work with preserving, describing, and attributing artworks, one still has to step further than the positivistic documentation, which is impossible within the current paradigm. Then the notion of the Ukrainianness in the art of Ukraine has to become a subject of a discussion, as once happened with the Englishness of the British art. It might pave the way for Ukrainian art history to go beyond the national paradigm and and focus on intricacies of its own history that are not worthy of staying in oblivion. Ukraine also has to take its rightful place in the East Central European context. It means connecting periphery, as Piotr Piotrovsky suggested, and opting for transnational research. The absence of Ukraine among, uh, from the big projects funded by ERC, for example, as a continent rupture, art and architecture in Central Europe, uh, craze, or art historiographies in the Central and Eastern Europe, and inquiry from the perspective on entangled history, has to be dealt with the, by establishing the networks for further cooperation within the projects designed for international teams. The Ukrainian art historiography will have to address the new readership and adjust as suggested by Matthew Rampley in his recent papers on challenges of writing modernism in Central Europe. Facing these challenges means confronting the imposed standards of Mr. Stosnavstvo. However, no matter how painful these changes might be, they are the only way to establish a decolonized new Ukrainian art history. Thank you for your attention.